Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Bandai Namco and From Software have very kindly given me early access to Armored Core 6, allowing me to create some fantastic videos to help introduce both newcomers and veterans alike to AC6. They have specifically asked creators with early access to keep it light on spoilers and not reveal any key information. And anyone who knows my Elden Ring videos knows this is exactly how I like to create my content anyway. I want to give you all the helpful information you need to help you understand and enjoy the game to its fullest while letting you discover everything for yourself. So if you would like some spoiler free lore, tips and guides for Armored Core 6 you are in exactly the right place as I have loads loads more in store for you in the coming weeks. To kick off my series of AC6 videos let's take a look at a story overview and a faction breakdown. As I say no spoilers here all of this information is readily available I've just fleshed it out and made it easily understandable for you. So firstly, what is Coral? Well, Coral is a revolutionary resource and data conduit which has transformed human civilization. Coral allowed humans to very quickly and easily progress to the next level of humanity, drastically improving the quality of life, automating so many things and allowing rapid expansion on other worlds. However, the fires of Ibis all but wiped out all known sources of Coral. Roll on many years later as humanity is still recovering from the loss of Coral, and it has now been identified that Coral still exists on a distant planet called Rubicon. Now, many corporations are racing to Rubicon to find out where the most dense quantities are to acquire it by any means necessary and sell it to the highest bidder. And this is where you come in. You are a mercenary who works for whichever company will pay you the most, helping to further their efforts for your own personal gain. Quite often this leads you to helping competing corporations hinder each other's efforts, sometimes even helping them retake the same location from each other. Again, no details here, but it is kind of hilarious hearing your newest employer talking about how one of their garrisons has been wiped out by an unknown armored core mercenary, and now you have to take it back for them, knowing full well that they have no idea that it was you that took it out in the first place. Now that you know the events that led us here, and you have a rundown of the overarching story, let's take a look at some of the factions and key characters involved in the game. The first character you're introduced to is your handler, Walter. Handlers are kind of like talent agents, in that they pretend to have your best interests at heart, but in reality their primary purpose is to get you the biggest jobs possible, so that they can take a huge cut of your paycheck. Now, Handler Walter seems like a good guy, and at this point, we don't have any reason to believe he's not. But honestly, and trust me, this is purely speculation on my part, because I'm recording this whilst I'm still fairly near the start of the game, but I really don't trust him. I'm very weary of his true intentions, just through the way he speaks and some of the things he says and does. I'll let you form your own opinion, though, because you'll see what I mean very early on. The next most important faction is independent mercenaries, because handlers wouldn't have any jobs if it wasn't for us independent mercs. The first independent mercenary you're introduced to is yourself. You are a generation 4 augmented human, and we'll talk about the generations later on in the video. Most independent mercenaries are just as greedy and immoral as the handlers themselves, and one such mercenary is Nosak. He snuck onto Rubicon hoping to get rich quick, taking advantage of the chaos brought about by the extraplanetary corporation's forays. The only other independent mercenary I know of so far who you also meet very early on is Sula. Sula is a veteran mercenary who was active in the star system surrounding Rubicon before the fires of Ibis. Sula is a patient of Generation 1 augmentation, better put, a survivor, because the technology in its infancy had less than a 10% success rate. Roughly 1 in every 11 humans who went through Generation 1 augmentation survived and made it to the point where they could actually use their own armoured core. After receiving his surgery, Sula lost all interest in mercenary work and now lives purely for the hunt. Now let's talk about the corporations that we work for. Balaam Industries are one of the corporations hoping to lay claim to the Coral on Rubicon. Their primary mission at the moment against their rivals, the Archibus Corporation, is competing in the Coral Survey race and laying claim to it. Got a job for you, 621. Your 
joining an operation planned by Balaam HQ. Check the briefing. Balaam Industries employs your services to gain the upper hand in the war against the Archivist Corporation, but Balaam have fallen behind because the Archivist Corporation is vastly technologically superior. Along with Balaam, you will be introduced to Darfung. Darfung are an affiliate corporation of Balaam Industries, and they specialize in manufacturing heavy weaponry and armor. Darfung is usually the requesting client for the jobs that you will go on, with Balaam handling the hiring process on their behalf. Balaam's in-house armored core team are called the Red Guns, with the commander being G1 Michigan. Bill's been up in my business. I'm surprised you'd even dare to call. Michigan, about my proposal. The majority of the Red Guns are very stereotypically American army bros. The banter between them is absolutely fantastic and they're a pleasure to work with. The voice acting and the lines in this game are brilliant and they really bring them to life. A real standout early mission that you will have already seen from the demos we played a while ago is with Volta and Iguazu and Gun 1 Michigan screaming at them over comms. I'll play a couple of voice lines here just so you can see what I mean. Before being taken on by the Red Guns, both Iguasu and Volta were partners in crime. Iguasu was a backstreet gambler, and after losing big, he was forced to undergo experimental fourth generation augmentation surgery to pay back his debtors. And a fun fact for you here, the character the player controls, codenamed Raven, is also a fourth generation armored core, with Iguasu being the only other fourth gen that I know of at the moment. We are also introduced to Gun 6 Red. He is one of the squad leaders of the Red Guns, and he has always idolized Commander Michigan, training through blood, sweat, and tears in order to emulate his idol. Another fun fact, the player's character is codenamed 621 by Handler Walter. However, when you join up and do missions with the Red Guns, you are given the codename Gun 13, because no one else wants to take it because it's an unlucky number and the last team member who had this number died horrifically. So let's hope the same fate doesn't befall us. Before I move on to the Archibus Corporation, I told you I was going to tell you a little bit more about the generations of augmented humans. As I say, Gen 1 was the very first generation. It was entirely experimental, and very few people survived the process. And those that did sometimes came out with horrific psychological, emotional, or physical scarring. Over time, the process has become better and better, and now has a near-perfect survival rate. Being of Generation 4, the player's character still had a pretty risky procedure. However, as of Gen 7, that's when the first use of Coral Substitution was implemented, and the survival rate and the quality of the augmentation increased dramatically from Gen 6 to Gen 7. And we'll talk more about the later generations as we come into a few of these squad members of the Archivist Corporation. Next up, we have got the Archivist Corporation. They are the other greedy, money and power hungry corporation hoping to lay claim to the coral on Rubicon. And one of their subsidiaries, Schneider, an affiliate company of the Archivist Corporation, is often the requesting client for any jobs requiring mercenary assistance. And Archivist themselves will then hire you to assist with their efforts. Where Balaam have their in house team of armored cores, the Red Guns. Archibus's in-house armored cores are the Vespers. The designation given to these armored core pilots directly relates to the squad they are in charge of. Therefore, V2 Snail is in charge of the second squad and is also in charge of all operations as all missions they send you on are issued by him. Next up, we have my favorite character in the game and I cannot wait to find out more about him. V4 Rusty is occasionally deployed on the field with you and he's got such a fun personality and he is hands down my favorite character. He accompanies you in fighting the Juggernaut and is an absolute force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. You must be Raven. One of the infamous handler Walter sounds. He is also one of the only people to be honest with you. 
revealing some very crucial information to you at the end of Operation Wall Climber. The other three members of the Archibus group that we've been introduced to so far are V6 Metalink. Metalink is a product of Generation 8. This was such a step up from Gen 7 that it completely rendered all previous generations obsolete, bringing about a new age of augmentation. And as her designation suggests, she is the sixth squad leader of the Vespers. And all we know of Swinburne at this point is that he is a Gen 7 augmented human, Gen 7 being the first to use coral substitution technology. And finally for Archibus, we have V8 Pater. He is the Vespers mercenary liaison and the leader of their 8th squad. He was one of the very first Generation 10 augmented humans. This is the latest and currently practiced form of augmentation surgery. Gen 10 represents the culmination of efforts to preserve the patient's humanity through the advanced knowledge and use of coral technology in the augmentation process. Other parties that you'll be introduced to include the local resistance forces, the Rubicon Liberation Front. The inhabitants of Rubicon have come together to form a militarized resistance against the invading forces seeking to steal their coral. They are extremely zealous and almost like religious fanatics in referring to themselves as the Coral Warriors, seeking to protect the sanctity of the coral, which is used to both sustain the planet itself and the Rubiconians who call the planet home. ECA has deployed the Cataphract, a special forces weapon specialized for ground combat. We want you to deny them the opportunity. Destroy the weapon first. They wish to build a future for Rubicon free from the iron grip of the Planetary Closure Administration, who we will cover in just a minute. They are ruled over by Father Dolmayan, leader of the Liberation Front. Father Dolmayan's right-hand man is Middle Flatwell, the military leader of the RLF. For a time, Flatwell worked as a spy within the extraplanetary corporations and has sway over a significant contact in Schneider's HR department. Apart from these two names popping up in texts, most of the other key players in the RLF remain a mystery. And while they are smaller in force, they continue to zealously struggle against the corporations. Next up, as I just mentioned, we have got the Planetary Closure Administration. They are the government's space fleet, a governmental force whose reach outside of Rubicon is unclear, but whose reach across the planet is very strong. You can see their giant warships and devastatingly powerful laser beams from almost anywhere on the planet. They are ruthless and devastatingly powerful and to be avoided at all costs. Next up, we have the independent weapons manufacturer, BAUS. BAUS stands for the Bellius Applied Weapons Systems. They are the biggest supplier of weapons and MTs in the Bellius region. All sides of the conflict use technology and weaponry supplied by BAUS. They are completely impartial and will sell to anyone regardless of affiliation. They have no allegiance or bias, and all they care about, just like Archibus and Balaam, is making money. And finally, we have the RAD, which are a subsection of a faction known as the Dozers. Little is known of them at this point, apart from the fact that they are also arms dealers. You meet one of their members very early on in the arena, Invincible Rummy. Like most Dozers, Rummy is utterly addicted to coral-based drugs. And in his perpetually adult state, he has convinced himself that he is an invincible demigod. Little is known about Dozers until very late in the game, apart from meeting Rummy in the arena. However, fairly early on, you are also introduced to Cinder Carla. She is the ringleader and chief engineer of the RID. She is ruthlessly cunning and clever, and using these qualities was able to climb the ranks quicker than anyone before, becoming the ringleader within six months of joining up. Now that you understand the story and the key factions involved in Armored Core 6, The Fires of Rubicon, make sure you subscribe for more Armored Core 6 content, and make sure you go check out the other videos to help you get started and help you get to grips with this incredibly amazing yet incredibly complex game world.
And with that, all that's left for me to say, my friends, is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.